We're here today to talk to a new author, Harold J. Fannin. He's written a book called Alexander Monier, Labyrinth of Genius. Good afternoon. afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. I'm very excited after four years and getting ready to launch this book and series. It is exciting. Writing a book has to be just really monumental. Well, it, yes, you start with an idea and then you watch everything come to life. And um, it, it takes a lot of time, but then you know you know when it's right, when it feels right. This book feels right. This, this book feels, feels real. I can tell from reading the first three chapters and looking at the cover of the book, this is no ordinary book. What makes this book unique? Well, it's not like one particular type of book. You couldn't say this is like Dickens or Fitzgerald or whatever, it's a mixture. Uh, it has big epic elements in it, you know, like you see in grandiose things like Star Wars and Harry Potter. Uh, this is an eight book series. The first book is trying to establish the character. Um, it has elements in it that are, are controversial because it deals with a lot of metaphysics and philosophy. And it's like uh, the Da Vinci Code. Mm -hmm. you know, I think it'll create as much controversy as that book will in time. Um, it's like 1984, there's a lot of politics involved with it. There's, there's a sense of forecasting things that are going to happen. We all love and look forward to the future, but we fear it too. Mm -hmm. And we know that we have greater and greater challenges as the population of the world grows, things get more complicated. We know the kind of heroes and kind of people that are going to have to step forward are going to have to be extraordinary. And this book's about extraordinary people, extraordinary characters. How did, how, you mentioned Harry Potter. How is this book similar to Harry Potter? Well, Harry Potter's melodrama, whereas uh, Alexander Munier is a realistic fiction. It's a genre that mixes uh, probably seven or eight different genres and it integrates them very tightly. Uh, Harry Potter is a fantasy that has to do with magic. Mm -hmm. uh, Alexander Munier, you read this book and you realize people like this character exists, his friends exist, his world exists. And it's a world we don't see because very few people are, have the extraordinary, profound giftedness that he and the kids that he runs around with. No different than Harry Potter runs around. All these people are wizards and have the capacity of magic. These people have the capacity of intellect at an extraordinary level. So who is Alexander Monier? Well, he's a boy who is so smart that current day psychologists cannot test him. They could not get a valid intelligence score on him. Um, so he's that bright. He has uh, the ability to total photographic memory. Everything he hears, sees, he remembers completely. Hmm. And on top of that, he integrates the two. He takes everything he knows, he takes everything that he remembers, and he's constantly integrating the knowledge. So he's like a growing encyclopedia that is um, in itself a phenomenon that's fascinating. So he's like a walking Wikipedia. He is, he is. And he, um, it, the talents are not just limited to his intelligence, it's what he does with it. And he's so human in the way that he brings these out into other people's lives and what he chooses to do, which is almost always the good thing. Uh, and he has, he's a child of destiny. There is a cloud of mystery in this book, just like Harry that is, it is very grandiose and very big and it works itself out over time in the book and uh, I think the readers will be fascinated by the trade and the complexity of the plot and the subplots. Well, if I met Alexander, would I notice anything different about him? Well, from a distance, you, you, know, you would just know that he's a very intense child but very, very pleasant, ordinary in, in, in most ways until you, unless you would sit down and start to talk to him and you would be amazed at the what he knew, what he talked about, the way he talked about it. You think you'd be talking to an adult, which is what happens when you meet gifted children. They think like adults, they work comfortable around adults because they're, they're so out of, out of synchronization with their development. You can have a second grade child reading high school level. You know, there's a lot of kids that are that way. Uh, I work with those as a teacher. Uh, they're fascinating characters, and this book is about those kind of characters. I noticed, I've read the first three chapters and I'm, I'm intrigued. I, I have a lot of questions about Alexander's mother, Sybil. Well, she is a clairvoyant that has mystery all around her and the mystery takes a long time in the series to uh, 
unravel, and I won't give anything away because it's very germane to the excitement that exists and why all this is happening. Uh, but she does have the power of dreams and the ability to foresee the future at an incredibly exceptional level. And um, what she is doing to raise her child, she knows who her child is, what he's supposed to do, and the impact that he's going to have on the world. And as a mother, it's her responsibility to make sure his needs are met. So is that why she's enrolled him in Cornell Academy? Well, Cornell Academy, which is, I think, one of the more fascinating aspects of the book, is a school created by a person who was gifted like Alexander, that never had the kind of school that he wished he could have had. So he had the resource, he created it. He created Cornell Academy for profoundly gifted kids. So you have a thousand kids, grades five through 12, that the kind of kids you see on 60 Minutes, kids that are in medical school at 12 and 13 years old. You know, we watch them for 10 minutes and forget about them. Well, they have their own life, their own world. Imagine a world where there's a whole school of these people interacting with each other. And at Cornell, there's, that's what happens there. And so the, the head of Cornell, Malcolm? Mm -hmm. Malcolm McCord, Dr. Mm -hmm. Malcolm McCord. Mm -hmm. he, he's the person who, um, he's also gifted? Very. He's, in fact, he's never met a student out of probably 2,500, 3,000 students that's smarter than he is. He's always wanted to find one that is smarter. He's found a couple that are as smart and different and their characters that play out in the book. But he's never found one that was smarter than he was. And Alexander is, and, and were he to find a child like this, he would want to clone them. And he has his ways. Very fascinating, complex, a rich playboy kind of character. Fascinating individual. He, he's a study in himself as far as the character. Was there a reason why you set Cornell uh, Academy in Cleveland, Ohio? Well. Being an Ohio native and knowing the Midwest and, and working with gifted kids, I uh, wanted to create an environment that I could write from that I knew very well. Uh, working with gifted kids for many years, uh, I'm able to draw on a sense of reality that felt more comfortable placing it in Ohio. It could be basically placed anywhere, but I was comfortable placing it in Cleveland, even though I'm not from Cleveland. I just felt a big, large city like that would be a very good place to be the setting for this book. So we can expect to learn more about Alexander's mother, Alexander and Malcolm McCord, and some of the other characters that surround Alexander as the book goes on and then the series goes Very on. much so. There's just like there's all the, all the adventure and stuff you saw in Harry Potter. In a school like that, it, it never sleeps. You have a school where the kids are always into something. and like a lot of gifted kids, they have a sense of justice and they will go out and try to deliver justice. And, and um, Alexander is that kind of child. He, he will try to write alone and he will go to great extremes to do it. Hmm. So Alexander is in some ways a normal child? Very. What and, ways? Well, he, he's not, for as bright as he is and as gifted as he is, there's nothing egotistical about him. He, he's the kind of kid that you'd be very happy to have uh, as a son, well-mannered, conscientious, sensitive, uh, kind, um, insightful. Um, but he also has a sense of social responsibility, which he takes up without being asked, and he acts on it. So what's real in this book? When you read the plot and you read the characters and you realize people like this really do exist and you get into the fiction of what could happen, everything that could happen in the book has the potential to happen because it's very realistic. It, there's nothing that happens in the book that could not theoretically happen. It's not fantasy. Ah, uh, so we're not dealing with magic or, no, you know. No, we're dealing with capabilities of real people going out doing real things in real time for real reasons. And that's where the excitement and the adventure comes. Because there's danger and there's good people and bad people in the book. There's a lot of, um, it, it, the book deals a lot with the nature of evil. And I think the readers will find some insights that they've never thought of before. Because metaphysically, this book takes you to places that you don't normally travel. So while we learn things from this book, we're also entertained. 
Oh, very much so. I think that's one of the first things a novel needs to do. And that takes a good story. Ballistic characters, good plots, well-written prose. Uh, I think the book offers all that. And uh, I'm a big believer in subplots. And the book is experimental in that I've combined all these genres very tightly together. So there's something in there for everybody as far as the kind of writing that they like. The adventure will be to see all of them come together in a way they've never seen them written before. And I, and I think if they read the first three chapters, I think they will get a sense that this book is radically different than the other books they've read. That answer goes right back to our original question concerning what makes this book unique. Thank you, Mr. Fannin. Thank you very much. I for, think you've explained it. Thank you. And I want to read more. <laughs>